Hey guys, Kenny and L here again. Welcome to part two of this three part video series on creating a growing and healthy children's ministry. In part one, we kick things off by talking about the number one thing every kid's ministry needs in order to be growing and healthy, and that's an effective team of volunteers. We talked about how the biggest struggle of nearly every children's pastor is figuring out how to recruit, develop, and retain quality volunteers and what you can do about it. Yeah, and in case you missed it, we definitely recommend checking it out because what you heard in that video lays a foundation for what we're going to talk about in parts two and part three of this series. So in this video, which is part two, we are going to talk about volunteers some more, but we are also going to talk about parents and kids too. So in this video, we are going to look at the six mistakes that children's pastors often make that kill growth for their volunteer teams, for their parent engagement, and for the kids in their ministries, and what you can do to avoid all of those mistakes. Yes, and in kids ministry, if you're not looking to grow the size of your team or attendance numbers, you're probably looking to grow the effectiveness of your volunteer team, grow your level of parent engagement, and of course, help kids grow spiritually both at church and at home. In kids ministry, we need to grow both deep and wide. But here's the thing. Sometimes we're so desperate to see immediate growth that we go about it in all the wrong ways. Sometimes the very things we think will help us grow actually end up sabotaging our growth in the end. Yeah, and we've been there, guys. We have done that. There have been times in our own ministry where we took a quick fix kind of approach that we thought would lead to growth, only to realize later that we were going about this all wrong. Because let's be honest, most of the time, we don't usually end up making big changes to our ministries or to our strategies until it's an emergency. And we actually need a quick fix, like when the pastor calls us out or when the board asks for a meeting, or a parent gets really angry, or no one shows up to serve when they're supposed to. So if you wait for an emergency to start thinking about how to grow your team or your ministry, it makes sense that you would look for a solution that can give you some really quick results. And you know, sometimes those quick fixes can give us good short-term results. Maybe that quick fix gets more volunteers in the room or maybe kids on the roster or parents opening our emails, but we have to balance short-term fixes with long-term sustainable solutions. Mm -hmm. When it comes to real sustainable growth, quick fixes aren't the best solution. Building a healthy ministry is the solution because healthy things grow. And if we want a healthy, growing ministry, we need to think in long term. So, okay, let's get to those six mistakes that children's pastors sometimes make. The first one is all about volunteers. And this one hits pretty close to home for me, maybe for you too. Children's pastors everywhere want to grow the number of kids they're reaching, of course, but in order to grow the number of kids you're reaching, you've probably figured out that you need to grow the number of volunteers on your team because obviously you need that infrastructure and all of that manpower to actually pastor and care for all of those kids who are showing up. But even if you know that you need volunteers to make your ministry happen, you might still be making this first mistake. So mistake number one that children's pastors make is this. They build their to-do list instead of building their volunteer teams. Now, there is a lot to do every week in children's ministry. You don't need us to tell you that. Uh, in kids' ministry, there are so many details, so much preparation, so much coordination, and so much stuff that needs to happen every single week. So it makes sense that your weekly to-do list feels miles and miles long. When we're under pressure to make Sunday happen every week, it often seems easier to just do it yourself rather than delegate it to someone else. And I get that. Trust me, delegation is hard. It takes communication, training, and time. And when you're already pressed for time each week, it might seem like you simply don't have time to delegate any of your to-do list to a volunteer. So when something needs to get done, what do we do? We usually take the quick fix approach and just add it to our to-do list rather than delegating it to a volunteer. Now, once in a while, this is fine. Sometimes it's quicker to just do something yourself, especially if it's a simple one-time task. But if you find yourself spending time on the same things every single week, that's a good indication that it's time to delegate those responsibilities to a volunteer or even a volunteer team. 
Yeah, and remember what we talked about in the last video, guys, asking for big commitment and empowering volunteers to do significant ministry is ultimately going to result in a stronger, healthier, more committed volunteer team for you. So whether it's prepping your curriculum or sorting your supplies, managing other volunteers, following up with new families, or maybe shopping for animal crackers, there are things that show up every single week on your to-do list that you can and should be delegating to volunteer teams. So that is what empowerment looks like. That is how you scale a ministry and multiply your capacity so that you have room to actually grow. But again, I know that this can be hard if you feel like your volunteers are not ready for greater responsibility, or maybe you simply don't have enough volunteers in order to make that happen. So in the third part of this video series, as well as an hour-long webinar that we have planned, we are going to show you in greater detail how to build an annual volunteer strategy that helps you prepare your volunteer teams for greater responsibility so that you can actually delegate to them more easily. But for now, I just want you to remember the color blue in this icon. Because if you want to build volunteer teams instead of simply building your to-do list, you are going to need a solid strategy and system in order to help you get there. And that is in the next video. So that's the first mistake children's pastors make that kill growth in their ministries. They build their to-do list instead of building volunteer teams, which puts a limit on what their ministry has the capacity to do. But there's another mistake we make that kills growth, and this one has to do with parents. Now, when we ask children's pastors what their biggest struggle is in kids' ministry, volunteers was the number one response. But parents was number two. Over and over again, we heard kids ministry leaders say that they were frustrated that parents didn't prioritize church, that they didn't care about what their children's ministry was doing, or that they didn't model consistent church attendance for their kids. Now, this is a tough one. It can be so frustrating, especially after you've spent every ounce of energy you've got on making Sunday happen. Uh, this next mistake might be a tough one to hear, but hang on with us and remember, we totally get the frustration. The second mistake children pastors make that kill growth in their ministries is this. They expect parent engagement instead of earning their attention. Yeah, and guys, I am so guilty of this. Kenny, I think you are too. So much of our frustration with parents has often had to do with misplaced expectations. Now, I used to get so caught up in thinking about how parents should bring their kids to church, should commit to a consistent service time, should disciple their kids at home, should open my emails, pay for events, show up for parent meetings, and pay attention to deadlines. Now, when that was my mindset, I was constantly frustrated that parents were not meeting my expectations. But here is the thing that at the time, I was really failing to consider. Maybe instead of getting frustrated because parents weren't meeting my expectations, I should have actually just reevaluated what my expectations were. And maybe instead of expecting parents to know or to care or to support what we were doing, we should have been trying harder to earn their attention, their care, and their support. Now, this can be a huge shift in mentality. It's a shift that helps you stay saner and helps you begin to foster a healthier relationship with parents, though. It's a relationship based on trust and on service rather than on expectations and frustration. Now, maybe that sounds nice, but you're wondering, well, what am I supposed to do about it? Good question. Don't you hate it when people tell you to completely change your approach, but don't tell you how to do it? Yes, yes me too. <laughs> so in the third video in the series, we're going to walk you through the annual strategy we use to build attention, trust, and engagement with parents. But for now, remember the color pink and this icon. We'll get back to it in more detail in our next video. So to recap, the second mistake children's pastors make that kill growth is expecting parent engagement instead of earning parents' attention. Because as long as we believe that parents owe us something, we're going to struggle to serve them effectively. And that's going to hurt the growth and health of our ministries in the long term. Okay, so we have talked about volunteers and we've talked about parents, but now let's actually talk about kids. You know, the people that our children's ministries are kind of all about. So the next four mistakes children's pastors make that kill growth all have to do with what we do directly for kids. So these mistakes have to do with the way that we teach kids, disciple kids, program our services for kids, and approach our special events for kids. So let's get into it by talking about our teaching strategies. Now, the third mistake that children's pastors make that kills growth in their ministries is this. They teach what adults want instead of what kids need. 
Ouch. All right, now this mistake can take many different forms. Here are a few ways we can make this mistake. We teach what adults want instead of what kids need when, number one, we forget what it was like to be a kid. You know what I mean, right? The older we get and the less time we spend with kids, the easier it is to forget how kids work. When we're too far removed from the world of a child, we can lose our ability to empathize with them. We forget how they think and learn, what they can do, what they like, and what they find funny. When we forget what it's like to be a kid, it's really hard to create a teaching strategy that truly connects with them where they are. Okay, and number two, we teach too high or too low. When you're not in tune with what kids need, it's so easy either to teach above their heads like tackling subjects or using teaching methods that don't connect with their concrete way of seeing the world or below their level like relying on tactics, presentations, and lessons that are too simple and not challenging enough. And number three, we choose curriculum for flash instead of substance. Now, you definitely want to use a curriculum that your volunteers and parents love because, oh man, if everyone hates it, you've got a problem on your hands. But if you're choosing a curriculum mostly because it's easy to use or adults like it, even though you're not happy with the way it actually teaches kids the Bible, you might want to rethink that. Yeah, and guys, we could go on and on and on and on about mistakes that we sometimes make when teaching kids the Bible, but let's leave it there for now. In the next video, we're actually going to go some more in depth into what an effective teaching strategy for kids might look like. But for now, keep the color red and this icon in mind. And remember, when it comes to your teaching, don't prioritize what adults want over what kids need. And now here is the next one. This one is all about discipleship. The fourth mistake children's pastors make that kills growth is this. They reduce discipleship to a program instead of seeing it as a process. Now, we see this all the time, and yeah, we've been guilty of this one too. You want to be intentional about kids' spiritual growth, so you decide to put a plan in place, which is awesome. But unfortunately, too often, we create discipleship strategies that resemble math class more closely than they resemble the ministry of Jesus. When you look at the way that Jesus led, pastored, and discipled his followers, you don't really see his disciples going through workbooks or attending a class or checking things off a discipleship checklist, but sometimes that's exactly our approach when it comes to discipling kids. It's not that workbooks or classes or checklists are bad, obviously, but they're not the whole picture. They are not enough to ensure that kids are really being discipled. So instead of thinking about discipleship as something we can carefully control or construct within the walls of our churches and the confines of our program, what if we gave ourselves and the kids we lead permission to view discipleship as more of a process and not the one that's going to be complete by the time they graduate from elementary school? Discipleship is a process that's going to take forever or at least our whole lives here on earth. Uh, sure, it seems a lot messier that way. It's harder to measure. It's harder to structure. And yeah, it's harder to summarize into nice quantitative data to show our leadership. But when we choose to look at discipleship as a lifelong process, a process that's never really finished, that's pretty imperfect, and that doesn't always move in a straight line, well, I think we give kids a healthier perspective of what it means to follow Jesus. When we view and talk about discipleship as a process rather than a program, we set more reasonable expectations for our kids, families, and volunteers, and we get a little bit closer to the way Jesus actually discipled people, a process that was relational, personal, individual, and never really complete. So mistake number four that children's pastors make is that they reduce discipleship to a program instead of seeing it as a process. And once again, in the next video, guys, we are going to show you how we created a strategy around discipleship that gave us some structure without over-programming discipleship. So keep the color orange and this icon in mind until then. Okay, so we have two more mistakes. This next one is all about our weekly programming for kids. Now, when it comes to weekly programming, there is one mistake that I think I see more often than any other in children's ministry. It is a trap that is so easy to fall into, and unfortunately, it is a huge killer of growth. Now, the fifth mistake that we see children's pastors make is this. They make fun an afterthought 
instead of a priority. Yes. And when it comes to children's ministry and youth ministry too, of course we want teaching and discipleship to be a priority. That's why we talked about those things first. But sometimes we can start to view spiritual depth and fun as enemies when they're actually pretty great friends. When we see fun and spiritual depth as enemies, we run the risk of making our weekly environments and teaching time stiff boring and irrelevant. But when we choose to see fun as a strategic, intentional teaching technique, we can create weekly programming that leverages fun in a way that number one, helps kids learn through activities, games, and humor. Number two, helps kids connect with the community by giving them opportunities to laugh, play, and build relationships with their peers and with committed adult volunteers. And number three, it helps kids see that living for Jesus isn't boring. It's a fun, exciting, adventure full of abundant life modeled for them by adults who are filled with joy. In children's ministry, we don't have to be afraid of fun, but we should always use it wisely. Fun for the sake of fun is fine sometimes, but fun is way better when it is leveraged to strategically help your message connect. So good. So guys, that was mistake number five that children's pastors make. They make fun an afterthought instead of a priority, but we know that you won't make that same mistake. You probably have already some ideas of how you do this in your ministry already, but in the third and last video in the series, we are going to help you think about some ways that you can strategically make fun a priority on a monthly, weekly, and annual basis. So for now, keep the color yellow and this icon in mind. Now, this is our sixth and final mistake children's pastors make that kills growth. This last one has to do with events. When it comes to events, children's pastors kill growth when they measure participation instead of measuring impact. Now, I have not always been very strategic with my events, and when it came to an event strategy, I often considered my events a success when a ton of people just showed up. Uh, That's all it took for me to feel like my events were working. If the room was full, my RSVP list was maxed out, and people liked it, I felt great. Eventually, though, I began to realize that participation wasn't actually a good enough indicator of whether or not my events were successful. Eventually, I began to realize that if my events weren't actually making a strategic impact and weren't aligned with the big picture strategy of my year, that I was not making the best use of my time or resources. It may feel counterintuitive, but it's true. Even the most well-attended events can actually be a hindrance to our growth if those events are not leading kids and families somewhere strategic. So are your events just for fun or are they designed to help kids have fun in the context of strategic relationships with their families or small groups? Do your events consider the experience of a first-time visitor and do they have a built-in strategy to help connect those first-time kids or families with your church when it's over? If your events, even the most well-attended events, aren't connected to a bigger overall strategy, then they can actually hinder your growth in the long term if they They are not successfully plugging kids into a small group, helping parents better connect with their kids, or connecting families with your church for the long haul. So, to avoid mistake number six when it comes to events, measure impact, not just participation. Yes, and guys, just to recap, here are the six things we recommend that you don't do if you are trying to grow your ministry in numbers, in depth, or in effectiveness. Number one, with your volunteers, do not build your to-do list build your volunteer teams. Number two, with parents, don't expect engagement, earn their attention. Number three, with your teaching, don't teach what adults want, teach what kids need. Number four, with discipleship, don't view it as a program, remember it is a process. Number five, with your weekly programming, don't make fun an afterthought, make it a priority. So there you have it. Those are the six mistakes that we often see children's pastors make that kill growth for kids, for parents, and for volunteers. So friends, please do not make these same mistakes. As we've unpacked each of these six areas, I'm guessing you've identified at least one weak spot where maybe you need to address your strategy for the way you lead volunteers, parents, or kids. Wherever those weak spots are for you, please don't be discouraged. It means you're one step closer to diagnosing and solving the source of your attendance problems and of making your ministry healthier overall. 
And the health of your ministry is super important because like we said last time, healthy things grow. We have one more video coming in the series about growth, so stick with us as we wrap things up and show you how to actually build an annual system and strategy in the six areas we just mentioned so you can avoid these six mistakes and build a healthy, growing ministry. All right, see you there. Yeah.